up for me. So uh, last week we um, got you guys all set up on wallets, right? Um, we got made sure that you could actually create a unique address for yourselves on the world of Web3 and get connected and uh, establish you know, your asset base. And I, we showed you a little bit about how to get off onto different chains and stuff. Um, but today we're gonna talk about DAOs, but I want to, um, I want to kind of quickly just review the, the, the key features of a wallet. And really what I want to focus on are the things that are unique to blockchain. Like, so a wallet holds asset, right? That's not unique to blockchain, any wallet holds assets. But anyone can see your balance. So this is not a typical safe in a, in a normal, you know, like, um, what's it called, Wells Fargo. You know, it's not a typical safe in one of those traditional banks. And anyone can see your transactions taking stuff in and out of your wallet. And anyone can also put assets in your wallet too which is a little bit weird. And if you guys f see anything on chains that have like a smaller transaction fee, like the Gnosis chain, and I'm gonna keep calling it XDI because that's what I kept calling it for years and they decided to change their name, so apologize up front for that. Um, you'll find something called uh, dusting. So people will take like really cheap tokens and drop them into your wallet. And it's usually like there's a URL associated with it or some sort of scam or phishing scam with it. But I just wanna w let you know that that's a thing that happens because anybody can put assets in your wallet. Only the private key holder can actually remove assets or create transactions or do things in the contract. Um, and also, before I forget, I'm Steve Derzinski, MIT undergrad, MBA, but you guys all know that, just in case people are tuning in for a new time. So anyways, okay. So there's a little bit, there's, there's a deeper thought process in this transparent wallet that I want you guys to all sort of recognize. And if you've done some transactions over the past week, you've, you're establishing a track record but there's a feature of blockchain that creates an immutability and a timestamp record. So if you did any transactions last week, which I know you all did one, create your wallet, right? There was, a, there was one transaction you did. And I happen to know I, there was another transaction in your wallet, which is I gave you all, I think, 10 cents or 50 cents. I can't remember what it was, but I just managed to drop a bunch of tokens into all of the wallets that were registered in the, in the WhatsApp group. Um, so this creates kind of an ongoing thing that, that turns into kind of a reputation and kind of the beginning of a credit score. So you can start to think about wallets, and right now we're focused on wallets that are individually owned. So every, every one of you has one wallet, right? Well, you can easily expand from that. One person can have multiple wallets, they can have multiple reputations, multiple credit scores, or certainly a business can have multiple wallets. Or multi, multiple people can sign on a wallet, which is what we're gonna talk about today. Um, and, and can coordinate using, using the blockchain as a, as a primary coordination mechanism. A couple of side notes that I wanted to take care of, some questions that came up after the last class. Um, if, you, if you have um, side chains and cross chains, so you know how I was showing you, you can go from Ethereum mainnet on your MetaMask and you can swap to a different chain. And you have that same address on both chains. Well, that doesn't mean you have the same assets on both chains, right? That would be a very easy hack if somebody could just create a fresh chain and be like, oh, great, now I've got all of your assets on my chain and I'm going to you know, steal all your assets. Um, so it's very easy in MetaMask to kind of move from chain to chain and see your balances on different chains, but it's not easy to actually move the assets across that. In order to do that, you have to do something called bridging. Um, I think Sam last week was like quickly trying to bridge some money from mainnet to die to get, to get, get some, some funding. Um, the, uh, and what you see is typically a lot of the like major asset holders are on mainnet, which is the primary one, but the transaction costs are very high there. So a lot of times people will move assets over to cheaper chains to do a lot of transactions. For this class and for all these workshops, I want you guys to focus on just the XDI one because that's very, very low, ex low expense to do a lot of things. And I've got some examples today that I'll, I'll go into in a second. Um, of course, you know, those, those cheaper chains are also where you get more of the dusting issues. So if you wanted to use a bridge to move funds from, from chain to chain, um, the only caveat I will say is that the, for the last year there's been a lot of hacks on bridges that move from chain to chain. Some, some a ridiculous amount of billions of dollars have been hacked in that. But that's typically limited to the people that are kind of operating the bridges themselves or trying to stake funds on both sides of it. If you're just trying to move some money from one side to the other, you shouldn't have much to worry about. Also, if it's less than like a million dollars, you probably shouldn't have much, that much to worry about. So. These are a couple of um, popular bridges to go from Ethereum to Polygon and Ethereum to Gnosis. Um, there's a bunch of other ones too. I would just be wary of ones that aren't, don't have a reputation and haven't been used previously because that could also be a phishing attack. So, Any questions on those? 
well, you're going to get these slides all after the class and everything else. Um, okay, another quick side note is if you go into Etherscan and you look at your wallet address, there's two different types of, of addresses. And this confuses a lot of people early on, so I want to make it clear right up front. The first one is what's called an EOA address, which is, what does it stand for? Externally owned account. One of the things I love about crypto is they, they just don't have any regard for making words and naming things very meaningful, right? <laughs> an EOA is an externally owned account, which basically means it's a public private key, which basically means it's a human, right? It's a human owned account. Um, and that those are just a simple wallet that has, um, has assets that are held in it. And it's, an, it's an, like an end user account, right? It's not doing anything else. The same zero X you know, number of digits can also be a contract. And you don't know that. If, if somebody just gave you these two, two things, you wouldn't know if one's a, a wallet or one's a contract until you went to Etherscan and typed it in and saw that, oh, this is actually a contract, it's not a wallet. And to make things even more confusing, there are some wallets that are smart contracts, like smart contract-based wallets, which is even more annoying. Anyways, um, the important thing to recognize is the difference between these two. You control with your public and private key the, the externally owned account and then your, if you launch a smart contract with your externally owned account, you own the contract and you control that contract. So you can look up on Etherscan, if you find a contract, you can see like who actually owns that contract and who's actually controlling that contract. Any question on that? This is kind of an important sort of base learning thing before we dive into the next phase here. So two different types of accounts, they look the same. Why do they look the same? Because it makes the math a hell of a lot easier and it makes the whole chain work well. So. Questions on that? No? Good? All right. Okay. Um, there's a number of benefits to blockchain that I mentioned briefly last week, but I wanted to kind of drill down on a few, a few of them more carefully. Um, and I said that there are some that are incremental benefits, like lower cost, um, and that, that a lot of the sort of incumbents take care of. Um, but high security and availability immutability and decentralization. So the last one is really the one that gets most exciting. So in the class that I taught on blockchain ventures, the question that we would ask every single class for whatever project you're working on is, why blockchain? Why do you need to use blockchain for this? Inevitably, it came down to, are you leveraging elements of you know, these benefits in your, in your business that you can't do with a, a wonderful little SQL server, which has been you know, beaten up for decades now and works wonderfully? Um, and there's a lot of businesses that are completely viable businesses that don't need Web3. And that's, you know, sometimes that's a hard lesson. Um, but it's super fun to find the ones that really leverage that decentralized piece. And I'm going to describe a couple today and a couple more next week. So, okay. Okay, so we've got one wallet. You guys all have one wallet, at least. Maybe you have more. Maybe you got more over the, over the week. Um, but now, what if you want to grow to several wallets? And what if you want to coordinate with your friends? So... <laughs> I have to tell you a quick side story, um, and this just totally comes from being an undergrad at MIT and then being an MBA at MIT. So as an undergrad at MIT, you, um, and it's kind of unfortunate, but usually if you've made it here as an undergraduate and you did any kind of project-based learning in high school, you were probably the star performer of the team. And there were probably people on that team who slacked off, and you probably had to take over for their slack. And then you actually like got a good grade as a result of your like ridiculous brains and skills and effort. Well, the lesson learned there is teams suck. And then you come to MIT with that attitude as an undergraduate, and you kind of come here and you're like, hey, yeah, rock stars win, teams suck. Of course, go to go to MBA, and it's like everybody that goes to the MBA program at MIT for my pro class was like, oh, I'm gonna learn all about technology, it's gonna be great, it's gonna be the best. Then you leave the, MI, the MBA program and you say, what was the best class you talk, talk you, you, you learned from? And just about most of the people I talked to were like, organizational behavior. <laughs> Which is like, how do people work well together? <laughs> so it's, a, it's a kind of an unfortunate fact that like, we learned as an undergraduate that to be the stud and to be the, 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 the charge of the brains is the, is the winning thing. And then as, as an MBA, you learn like to work well with others is the, is the solution. So I'm hopeful that maybe we can all come together and do that. But the, the one lesson I know that, that resonates well with undergraduates is, you know, you've been on a team and there's a whole bunch of really star players and they hate each other. And that team does poorly. <laughs> And you get another team with a few star players, but everybody just loves working together and loves coming together and working together. And that team does extremely well. So 
What's the lesson learned here? Get to know your classmates and then think to yourself, do I wanna go into business with this person? Do, would I get charged up every day to go to the office and work with this person? Or would I resent the hell out of the fact that this jerk is telling me, anyways. <laughs> you get the idea. Okay, back to, back to Web3. <laughs> That was just a little blockchain venture lecture I had, to, I had to go down the path of, so, okay. All right, with that as a backdrop, kind of like being individuals and being your own wallet owner, and now we wanna create an organization that's full of individuals that are all working together, how can we coordinate this on the blockchain? You like that segue, you like that segue? Okay. Um, so one way we can do it is with something called a multi-sig, which is short for multi-signature. Um, and Gnosis Safe, which again, they've changed the names, all these people in Gnosis world changing the names of it, it's now called just plain Safe, um, is a digital uh, bank, a digital asset holder. And, and they're, they're charging ahead with the digital ownership economy. Right now they have about 40 billion um, in all of the safes under management. It's not their 40 billion, it's just that people have used their tools to store a bunch of assets in them. And what I'd like to do is, um, uh, well, we'll start, we'll create a safe in a second here. You guys will all have a safe. Um, but if you think about an example, if you have an investment club with five friends and you all want to get together and own digital assets and invest in them, you know, people have been doing this for decades, right? Why, is, why, why would we need a blockchain to do this? I mean, it's a good example, okay? So we want to pool these funds and we want to take decisions about how we're going to actually manage the funds. The way that a safe works, well, I guess I don't have music anymore. The way that, that the safe works is that it creates a, a threshold of, of required signatures that are needed in order to, in order to um, do any transactions or take any funds out, basically. And it's, it's a fairly simple process. Um, and I guess the important thing to recognize here is we're not gonna write any code, and, but we're also gonna launch a smart contract and the critical element of launching a smart contract using the Gnosis Safe tool that, that you guys should recognize is that there's already billions of dollars that are being held with these smart contracts. So you don't have to write your own smart contract, you don't have to get it audited, and you don't have to get it battle tested for years and make sure nobody can hack it. So those three facts on itself, also the fact that the Safe stuff is a really great tool, um, kind of lead you to want to create, you know, use these tools as they, as they are, and there's, as I mentioned, there's a number of other people that are doing it. So, um, let me think. If you want to open your laptops now and you can start creating a safe, all you have to do is go to gnosis-safe.io and you'll notice they have like some fantastic tools on managing like which, which of these, um, which chain are you on and which chain is your wallet on. Right now I think my wallet is on Gnosis chain and the actual safe is on Gnosis chain. There's a, obviously a challenge of managing multi-chain assets, especially when you have wallets on one and, and safes on another one. And you can create a safe, and I'll just walk through this sort of process, and I'm sure you guys will figure it out really fast. So you create a new safe here, you give it a name. I gave my name MIT Bitcoin dash Sloan Blockchain. Simple enough. And then, um, this is probably the most interesting page of all of it. You actually give, you can give vanity names under owner names, but then you give wallet addresses, and these will be owners of the assets. And then at the bottom here, I've got what is the transaction requires confirmation of one of two owners, three of six owners, whatever your policy is. So this is, this is where, where being, the, being the star versus working well with others is critical. So, Getting together with your team and deciding what is our threshold going to be for, for whether or not we can take money out of a safe is a really important question, right? But it gets at deep, deeper roots of things like, do I trust the other members that I'm in the safe with <laughs> or not? Do I want to have it five of six maybe? Do I, want to, you know, do I want to create a very high threshold so nobody can take any money out? And this is one threshold for the safe that applies to all transactions, which includes I want to change out an owner. Somebody wants to, I want to kick somebody out and bring somebody else in, right? So then five of six people have to agree on that if that's what your threshold happens to be. Um, you can create a safe right now with one of one, which is fine because you can always add another owner later on if you're the one decider, right? You can just say, I want to add another owner to this thing and you can sign the transaction to make it happen. So you can go ahead and create a, create a, um, a safe and I would recommend you do it on the X die. So I've created a safe here and you'll notice that it cost me, uh, what is that, a tenth, of a, a tenth of a cent. So you guys should all have 
a MetaMask account on XDAI, and you should have, who, who here has a balance on XDAI? Can tell me what their balance is. Yes? Uh, 0 0.1. 0 0.1, 10 cents? Yeah. Or 10, 0.1 XDAI, technically speaking, right? Even though it's a stable coin and it's worth a dollar. So you should all be able to generate uh, a safe on your own with one of one signer that you own completely and you can add more people to it. Does anybody have a safe that they've created? Or should I pause here? Pause here for dramatic effect. Any questions while we let people build a safe? Not everybody had bought laptops. <laughs> if you're watching at home, you should be watching it from a laptop, so you should be able to do it. So once you actually create a safe, what's happening is you're creating a copy of the smart contract that the Gnosis Safe guys wrote and battle tested and launching it on the XDAI chain. And you'll get a, a, an address of that safe itself. And if you want to take that address and go to Etherscan, or sorry, go to Blockscan, which is the one for XDAI, um, is, the, is the, the viewer into the XDAI chain, you can look at the smart contract that that safe represents. And it's, you know, it's well beat up, it's well documented and everything else. Ta-da! Okay. Is everybody all set with creating a safe? We can move on. Unless you want to pause a little longer. Okay. So for, for a safe itself, the question comes, how do, you, how do you generate a vote or how do you generate a transaction that requires signatures? And, and because a safe is a very simple multi-sig, it's all transactional and it's all financial. So if I want to move tokens out, if I want to propose to kind of transfer money in and out of this, or you know, if I want to buy some, another token with the current token that we have in Treasury, um, that all says, well, you're just one signer, you're just one wallet, you don't actually have the authority to kind of make that transaction, you need to put this up for vote. So then whatever your threshold margin is, it'll just take that number of people to do it. The important things to note for Gnosis Safe is that it will go on, it will stay open forever, like the transaction will stay open forever, unless somebody says, let's cancel this transaction. Um, and it will, it will wait until the threshold is, is met before it actually takes action. The other thing to recognize is as soon as the threshold is met, the transaction takes place. So let's say, say for example, you know, we wanted to invest in some, some, somebody else's token with some of the, some of the USDC we had in, in, a, in a Gnosis Safe treasury. And we said, hey, let's make this investment. So somebody creates the transaction, the Gnosis Safe, and makes it. And then as soon as, if it's three of six, for example, as soon as the third person says okay and signs that transaction and confirms it, the actual purchase is made like almost immediately. So, so that, that's an important element and an important difference between a lot of the on-chain activities and off-chain activities. And this is kind of a strong differentiator between Web3 businesses and what you would normally do. So normally, like an investment club, if I just had a bunch of clipboards and everybody was hanging around on the porch on Sunday afternoon and we're talking about investments we wanted to make, we could say like, okay, yeah, let's make, let's make that investment. Then somebody gets charged with going and buying those, the stock or whatever and, and taking money out. And that has to be you know, allocated with paper and you know, the whole traditional way of doing things. Um, but it's hard to know like, did it actually happen or not? Um, with on-chain transactions and with on-chain safes, you know that as soon as somebody says, yeah, the you know, last person says, yeah, that that transaction is gonna automatically be executed. And that's, I think we, you remember last time we were talking about smart contracts and how it's kind of a misnomer. It's really just sort of automated programs. That's really the, the, the key benefit of having a, a safe and having the smart contract on there is that things get automatically created. You're not depending on a law firm. You're not depending on you know, somebody driving to the bank or somebody forgetting their password or anything else. It just automatically happens. So that's an important distinction to think about for multi-sigs or safes. I just wanted to um, uh, make it clear about this one as we kind of move into the move into the next, the next topic. Um, but of course, the question is, other safes in use and how big can they get? Um, if anybody's heard of BitDAO, they actually manage their entire DAO um, using kind of just Discord chat channels and a Gnosis safe. 
and they use a very large Gnosis safe. And if you want to use your QR code, that's actually the address of their Gnosis safe. So you could put that into the Gnosis safe application and read it. The Gnosis safe application gives you the option of being able to just look at other people's safes. You can also look at them on Etherscan as well. You can just browse through all the transactions. But the Gnosis Safe um, interface allows you to see kind of much more interesting things that have happened and it helps translate it into like real English. Um, so if you'll notice here, this particular safe has $2.3 billion um, in assets stored on chain. Uh, and, and that's kind of like the first interesting feature. Let me see if I can pull up the... Uh, you can, you can grab that. If you guys all have that QR code, I'll just go ahead and show you the, the um, I think I have it in here somewhere. Oops. Oops. Here it is. Yeah, here it is. Okay. So here we have BitDAO's safe, and you'll notice it's read-only, so I am not a signer on this safe. And even if I was, I probably shouldn't log in with that wallet standing here in front of all of you. Um, by the way, a really unpopular thing to ask at a crypto conference is, are you a signer on a multi-sig? It turns out people don't particularly like to admit that <laughs> for a variety of reasons. Um, do you have the private keys to a billion dollars in your, in your laptop? Cool. Let's, let's, anyways, so, um, okay. So if you're, if you're on the, um, the Gnosis safe and, and you're looking at this particular um, thing, you can see all of the assets they have. So a whole bunch of BitDAO and a whole bunch of Ether. Uh, but then, of course, the most interesting part is if we look at the history of all the transactions they've made. So they, what is this, yesterday? They, they moved 29 million USDT, or maybe they converted it to USDC. Um, so what's the point in all of this? The point is that you can see someone who's managing their funds and exactly where they're allocating money and moving money in and out to. And that's pretty powerful, and it's also pretty scary, right? Like, like... I kind of like it being able to see what these guys are doing, but I don't really want to show people what I'm doing. <laughs> so nonetheless, um, it's really powerful when you're trying to convince people that you have the right investment plan and you want to be completely transparent about, about all of your financial transactions. And then I think, is there anything in the queue here? Oh yeah, there's, there's one thing in the queue here that needs confirmation. So this is waiting for, a, waiting for a signature. I guess somebody wants to move 40 million USDC out of the, out of the Dow and uh, it's waiting for someone else to do it. So if we look over here, you can see this, you see this little three slash six. So that's, that's three slash six, yeah. Three out of six signers are required to confirm the transaction. So right now there's only one person that wants to do that. So is that a rogue, one of the six rogue signers? I don't know who it is that's, that started that transaction, so. Anyways, it's a, it's a very interesting and powerful tool to kind of research and look into um, uh, how people are managing their DAOs. Questions on that? Okay. Okay. Um, so a multi-sig and a safe is, a, is a, a wonderful tool, and I think you guys should all use it in any kind of Web3 business you're operating in. It doesn't have to be the primary you know, thing that you manage on like BitDAO is, but it can be sort of a, a side treasury if you're trying to manage a small project on. It's a super robust tool, and I highly recommend you, you all use it. However, there are um, you know, missing components to it. If you think about, you know, we're not all doing investment DAOs, right? We're doing, we're doing more than just that. We're, we want to run a full business. So if I want to have a fully Web3 native organization, you know, and I want to take all of my LLC stuff and bring it completely online, well, the first question I have to ask is, what's the purpose of my organization? And that's for the blockchain ventures class to talk about, or any of your entrepreneurial class, right? You have to think about, why am I in business? What am I starting up for? I just put that there because it felt incomplete without that question. We always ask that question, like, why are you in business? Why are you doing this? Um, but then typically, the purpose of an organization is to allocate resources, right? Whether you're allocating people, or you're, you're, you're allocating time, or you're allocating budgets. Most of the time, we, we talk about allocating budgets. Um, especially with kind of thinking about like safes, you know, where you're, you're allocating investment funds. Um, but if you think about, uh, I want to approve a budget somewhere and I want to move some funds over, I can do that with, um, I can do that with a, with, a, with a safe. But what if I just wanted to approve kind of somebody's proposal on, um, what did I say, is, you know, I want to hold a vote for whether or not cereal is a soup, right? 
Turns out I can actually do that vote online. I can do that in a DAO, and I can execute it. Now, why would I want to do that? Because I want to capture people's answers on chain. Right? I don't necessarily, I can't necessarily take action on chain. I may have to do something else off chain. Like if I, if I wanted to prove someone's proposal, um, only part of the, the votes can be captured on chain. But that's still at least, you know, at least it locks in in that immutable layer uh, and, that, and that sort of um, uh, transparent layer, what, how exactly everyone voted. That, and that's a, an important aspect of it. Right, so some examples, strategic decisions, investments, approved budgets. Um, the ledger is gonna be fully public, and then each, each of the voting of how people voted is gonna be fully public as well. Okay, any questions about organizations and bringing them online? Otherwise, we'll dive into DAO tooling here. Okay, cool. Um, so, DAO tooling has been around for a long time, and what I want to show you is some very, very early but very robust tools. So the, the, the later stuff might have sexier bells and whistles, but what I'm, what I'm trying to present to you guys is that it's much better to use stuff that's been tried and true, especially in the, in the world of hacking. And also because if you think about, you know, just think about DAOs and running your business on Web3 versus Web2, like we were talking about a minute ago, like, why wouldn't I just use a SQL server, you know? Well, then I have to select a cloud provider, and maybe that I want to compete with that cloud provider, or maybe I want to compete with a bunch of other players. The benefit of launching an organization on a, on a DAO is that I could, you know, run a, an organization that competes with Gnosis Chain if I wanted to. And Gnosis Chain wouldn't be able to sort of stop my organization in any sort of devious way, right? They get to see the transaction just like anything else. One of the immutable and unstoppable aspects of Web3 is that even the organizations themselves can't do it because it's a, because it's a decentralized network for all of the transactions that happen. Is that making sense? Yes? Okay, good. All right. <laughs> okay, so Aragon is probably one of the oldest DAO tooling companies. They've been around for a long time, um, and they have some, some really great tooling and some really complex tooling as well. So I want to dive into that, but there's also Colony, DAO House, um, a lot of them, as you saw uh, with, the, with the really big safes, they do a lot of their transactions on mainnet. We're going to just do it on XDAI right now because it's a lot cheaper and we can actually create an organization. Um, there is a group called OneHive, and next week we're going to talk a little more about kind of what the, what the tooling is on mainnet, what the tooling is on XDAI, and what the tooling is on, on Polygon. And a lot, of those, a lot of those alternate chains have exactly the equivalent of the initial tooling on mainnet, just on alternate chains. So OneHive is an organization that basically takes a lot of the tools that are on mainnet and brings, brings them into the Gnosis chain world. So OneHive, the guys at OneHive, fantastic guys, I know a lot of them, um, took all of the tooling from Aragon, which is open source tooling, and brought it into the world of XDAI. So if you guys want to go to aragon.onehive.org, ah, so the first question is, uh, if we want to set up an organization, you guys should all, everybody with a laptop should try and get together with three or four people near you, and then you can create an organization together. I see there's, there's some people that are already grouped up. But if you don't have a laptop, <laughs> I guess you don't have to worry about it. Um, because what I want to do is, is have you guys, uh, you're going to have to share the wallets with each other. So I think the WhatsApp, um, thing is online and you can you can actually share with each other. So if you just look to the right and look to the left of you, maybe you guys can, can figure out how to kind of pair up. What do we think, Gabriel? Yeah, just give them a minute to pair yeah, up. And yeah. If someone doesn't have a team, raise their hand and help facilitate. <coughs> Oh, okay, we're good. <laughs> Who doesn't have a team? Excellent.
All right, so one of you is going to actually do the creation. So you get to you get to pick the pick the leader of your group that's going to actually create the the online organization, the online business. So let me give you a second to decide who's who's got the laptop and who has the most amount of die in their wallet. If you need more die, you can you can aggregate together. Actually, everybody, all of you guys can send your die to one person. The minimum is point. No, the the minimum is. Uh, what do you mean? I just did one today, and it was point uh, oh seven. Okay, are we ready? Are we all ready to create an org? I'm just gonna I'm just gonna whip through these things. The first thing the first thing I want to you guys to all talk about now amongst yourself is there's a voting module which is the most complex part of this whole process. And remember how we talked about three of six was the was the bit DAO sort of threshold. This gets a layer more complicated, which is there's three factors that you have to select on. If somebody puts up something for a vote, what's the time frame to allow people to weigh in on that? And this is, if you think about like hundreds of people in an organization, this makes a lot more sense. Is it gonna be a day? Is it gonna be 15 minutes? Is it gonna be 10 days? You know, if it's a major transaction, you wanna give it a lot of time. Unfortunately, you get to select that parameter once in the organization you're creating. So think about the time frame that you want for voting. If you wanna just create a, a dummy one right now, 15 minutes is good, because then you can go through a bunch of iterations on it. Uh, and then the minimum approval percentage of all the tokens that have voted. So the wallets that you guys come together on to create an organization are gonna have tokens associated with them, and it's a, it's a token-weighted vote. So if you have four people, they each have 100 tokens, that's 400 tokens, so then 15% would be like basically one person voting, right? That would, uh, out of all four of you would, would sort of carry the vote. So you have to think about those calculations, and then it's, the question is, What's the minimum, uh, sorry, 15% of the total number uh, in order to reach that threshold? And then the question is, of the people that voted, what is the percentage uh, that have said yes or no to that? So that's the third parameter, is the support percentage. I'm bringing this up because it's a little bit complex in the, in the documentation and the actual um, page isn't that clear. So when you go, if you think about going through a vote, you can just select the basics right now just to kind of get something up and running. Um, if it's four of you guys, then you're gonna have four hopefully even weighted number of tokens, but you get to decide that in a minute. Um, but let me, let me actually go through the screens here and then you, and you, can, you can see what I'm doing and before you kind of dive into it to make a decision. So you create an organization and then I want you to select the company organization. You can get more complex later on. There's things called dandelion organizations which allows individuals to rage quit and stuff. Um, you know, we don't need to talk about that today. I could happy to talk to you about offline, but for simplicity purposes, there's a few modules in here, a voting module, a token module, and a finance module, sort of the core things you need in any kind of basic business. Um, you need to give it a name. It has to be a unique name. I've already taken MIT Bitcoin, so you can't take that one. Um, and you move on to the next one, and then this is where you have to select those parameters. What's the percentage of support that you want to have What's the minimum of approval? And then how long do you want the vote to last? If you think about, you know, I want to make a major proposal to spend $5 million, I probably want to let that go for 10 days or so to make sure that there's plenty of time for people to vote in. But then you also have to think about, if I don't get 15% of the people that can vote to vote, then the proposal just goes to null. So it doesn't, you know, so if you set the time too short, then you're not gonna have enough time for people to actually get to their computers and, and cast a vote or understand and read the kind of proposal to make a vote, voting decision on it. So. so if you want, just for testing purposes, if you wanna put it like at 15 minutes and then you can leave these other two as they are, that's probably fine for today. Um, I'm sure you'll find errors in it and it won't be very comfortable in how you're doing in the transaction. It might time out after a few minutes and all of a sudden tell you that no vote happened and you'll have to redo a new vote. So the next, the next um, page after that, after you decide those parameters, is to give your token a name and you give your token a symbol and then you can add, this little add more button is where you want to add all members of your organization. And you can give yourself a number of tokens at this point. This is where the magic happens. This is where the tokens are created. This is where you're creating a token and giving yourselves tokens. 
So, you know, I'm sure you think your organization is worth billions of dollars and this is where you're starting to hand out money. So if any of you have already done a startup before, you know the cap table is the most fun por portion of the entire startup, right? Um, founder shares and all the rest of the stuff. This is kind of the essence of that here. Um, it doesn't look as exciting, but nonetheless, um, you want to make sure, and, and everybody should be paying attention to this, this is all done transparently on Web3, so you'll all see kind of how the allocation of, of tokens happens in the uh, uh, online after, after it's launched. Questions? I think that's, I mean, those are really the complex elements of what you're trying to decide here. And then after you kind of review things and launch an organization, you'll get, um, oh, this was, sorry, it was a .07. So it cost me seven cents to actually launch this organization. Assuming you guys all have like 10 cents, 10 die, right? It says you need at least .1. .1? Oh, you just created an safe, right, 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 right. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll have to figure out how to get you a few more die. All right. Okay. Can, it, can anybody create an organization or does everybody need more die? No, yes. Nobody's great one. Okay. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yes, sorry. So the, the token holder is can be the wallet that you're currently connected to, but it can also be your partner's wallet, and you can add more here. I should have shown that with more people on here because typically you don't create an organization with one wallet holder, you create it with multiple wallet holders. So this should be you know, multiple wallet holders here all in your organization and presumably you start out with the same number of tokens unless one person is kind of like, I'm gonna have 90% of all the tokens and then everybody else is gonna have fewer of them. Does anybody have a company name they want to share? An organization name? Was it? Quick call. All right, quick call. What's your token symbol? <laughs> QCL. All right. All right. We're gonna be we're gonna be trading QCL here shortly. Okay. So we'll we'll figure out how to how to make sure you guys can can uh, create your organizations. But the, the important point is after you launch this and you launch the organization, there's actually a token, an ERC20 token that's minted on the, uh, on the Gnosis Chain blockchain. Uh, and it'll be, a real, it'll be a real live token and you'll have a certain number of those in your wallets. So that's the, that's the kind of punchline of, of kind of using all this tools is that you have all the wonderful voting capability, but then you have an allocation of resources and an allocation of, of basically of sh shares, I suppose, but they're really just tokens. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a live ERC-20 token, uh, and you can do a number of things with it, which we'll talk about next week. Okay. I think we talked about that already. Okay. Okay, so I guess now I can send out some XDI, but let me ask, answer questions if you guys have anything. I kind of don't have any more slides for you, so have at it. <laughs> yes. Thank you for that question. Yes. So one of the beautiful things about Aragon is it's been around for a long time and it has a wonderful code base. One of the terrible things about Aragon is that it's got a huge code base and it often takes a long time to load. So if you, after you create it, you may want to hit like reload or refresh and then it'll, it should come up and populate. But once you're, once you're up and running, you should see a voting module and a finance module and a token module. So in the finance is typically like your treasury where you're just holding funds and you can allocate them however you want to, which all goes, to a, goes into a transaction. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, 
Oh, yeah, good question. Um, the code base itself is pretty damn robust. So whatever token you create, it's going to be the same one on mainnet as it is on, on XDAI. So that, that's pretty solid. Um, if, you, <laughs> if you change those parameters such that someone can do kind of a hack that you just think about, you know, convincing a couple of people to pr approve a transaction in the middle of the night or whatever, and that gets you over the threshold, which gets you the money, then, then, then yes, there, there, there would be a problem. But that's sort of a, a user error, right? So um, from, from a code perspective, it's, it's very robust. I don't know the assets under management for, for Aragon, but I'm sure it's substantial. Other questions? Yes. So um, some of the newer platforms are a lot more streamlined. In fact, there's, there's one I, I mentioned a minute ago called um, Dow House. And Dow House actually was started because people were annoyed at how bloated um, Aragon was. And they, they launched, and they're completely on XDAI, so it's super low transaction cost and super minimal code. I don't think they've been hacked, um, but you know it's, it's newer. So remember the first time I was talking, it was like, Bitcoin is the longest chain, and so it's therefore it is more secure than kind of shorter chains. That's kind of how it works in, in the world of Web3. If something's been around longer and it's been beaten up and it's got lots of assets under management and it hasn't fallen down yet, it's probably pretty pretty strong. So so that's the argument for Aragon, but Dow House. And and, and actually there's like juice, there's like a thousand other of them now. Like when I was first doing these years ago, these were the big three. And now there's probably a hundred other ones. I think there's one called Juicebox that's pretty popular, um, which is just kind of a quick way to sort of set up an organization and kind of run with it. Um, a lot cheaper way to do it. Uh, and there's, actually, why don't you come back next week and tell me what you've discovered? Because I was hoping that you guys were going to find more things. So, Other questions? Yeah, exactly, yes. Um, in fact, I can show you, I think I have it on here. Um, I created a, an organization here, and let me see if I've got my voting here. It's gonna take a second to vote, but I, you can just have it ask a question and put it up for vote, and then people will vote based on their token holdings for, that, for the answer to that question. So I actually asked the question, is cereal soup? Right? And since I'm the only token holder in this and I said yes, you know, the motion carries, right? So you're absolutely right. It's the token weighted um, voting criteria and then it's, it's all on chain and it's all transparent and it's all locked in time too so we know when it happened and who voted for what. Yes? Yeah, so it's any of the members, you know, when you first add a member to it, any of those members can begin a transaction or ask for a vote. So if you think about, the, in the old world sense, the board of directors, right? So if you're on the board of directors, one of the board members can propose a vote to the board. Same thing. Yeah. I have to give, send you my key and then you put it in? No, 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 no. Okay. Yeah. Out. yeah, so um, good question. The question is, can someone jump in and kind of become a member of my DAO without me knowing it? Um, no, what, what happens is you have to be voted in. So if there's a proposal to bring somebody else on board, uh, that proposal can go up for vote, a token-weighted vote, just like the other, you know, Israel soup uh, uh, token-weighted vote. Um, and then if that's approved, then they would they would come on board and you'd add a member to the organization. So is the purpose of the token just to say what your, your vote pays for? In this particular example, yes. It is also um, a sort of ownership of this. If you think about any time there's a stock-weighted vote, there's, there's going to be a, 
uh, equity component to it, shall we say. Question, yes, sir. Can you share your voting rights with another member? Can you do like a proxy, you mean? Ah, I, yes, yes, this is, this is a very good question. Um, the question is, if, uh, can a group of people vote together collectively? Uh, if you want to do it on, a, you know, on, a, on an ad hoc basis, it's a little more challenging. But one of the interesting things is you notice that when I added a member, it was just an Ethereum wallet address. Well, an, I could also include, I could take, you know, let's take part one of, the, of, this, of this discussion, a safe, and I could take the safe's address and make that a member of my Aragon DAO. So now the people that are voting in the safe become members in that DAO. So that collective decision making can happen on behalf of the, of the organization. So that just the people that have the voting power in the, in the safe can actually cast their vote and cast on behalf of all of the tokens that are in that safe. It's a little more complicated, but it can be done. I mean, if, if you have a large amount of funds and you want to just, all these people want to vote together collectively, you can, you can set it up that way. Yes, Gabriel. Yes, but not with the tooling that I'm showing you today, uh, because this is a really simple one. If you guys want to, if you saw when you first set up your, your organization, there was kind of a dandelion and a company, and there's like a bunch of other different templates that they've set up. Each one of those has different modules in it, and there's a, there's a, a much greater uh, layers of complexity that allows you to do all that, kind of, all that kind of stuff. And of course, with complexity becomes more hack surfaces and more other issues, so... Um, I would be careful of all those things. Clearly, my uh, my uh, uh, what, what did I say before about it being very slow is is coming true here. Let me see if I've got the voting loading up here. No votes. All right. I thought I had some votes in here. Oh well. I guess cereal is not a soup. <laughs> and you'll see the you'll see the title here: MIT Bitcoin. Dot Aragon dot ID. So anybody, you should be able to just type that in to go look at an organization, and you can see you know, that, that what I've created here. And I have the MIT BTC token now. Pretty incredible. You think I'm the only one that has the MIT BTC token on the XDAI chain? <laughs> no, that's right. that's right. Since I just made it a few minutes ago. So how do you know if a token is real or not? That's a, something we'll talk about next class. Any other questions on this? Otherwise, I, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to kind of get down here and I'll, I'll, I'll disperse a whole bunch, another dime to all of you guys, or maybe even 50 cents because you're that good. Yes, sir. Can you what? Can you sell the tokens that are in your wallet? What a great question. Yes. You can. The ERC20 token that we mint with this is in your wallet and it is completely transferable. So you can, you can transfer them over to somebody else or you can issue them and, and trade them for, for other trading pairs. But I'm getting ahead of myself. That's what we're going to talk about next week. Are you saying the MIT BTC? Yes. Yes. Could be. Tune in next week for your favorite your favorite uh, superhero. What is it called? Quick quick step quick quick look quick call quick call. All right, quick call. Okay, guys. Any other questions? Otherwise, I'll just I'll just sit up here. I'm gonna take off my uh, take off the display so you guys can't see how I'm doing this transaction, and then I'll just disperse a bunch of X I to you so you can you can sit here and make your own. Uh, Make your own organizations, and maybe you can make four or five of them. I mean, why not? They are immutable. They are permanently on chain. Oh, that was one one thing I forgot to mention last time. Does uh, does anybody have a finance background and remember when we talked about ledgers? And when you make a ledger entry, what happens if you make a mistake in a ledger entry? How do you fix that mistake? Anybody want to make a guess? 
Nobody's got a finance background. When you make an entry on a ledger, even going back 100 years, the only way to fix that mistake is not to erase it, like the accountants, bookkeepers never had erases. You make a, you make a reverse entry. It's the same thing is true for the immutable blockchain. And if there's a mistake, you just add another thing on it. So, so I want you to get, keep that in mind as you interact with any kind of on-chain transaction. If you put up a vote and it's wrong, or you launch an organization and it's wrong, you can't erase it. You just launch another organization. <laughs> you may not even want to undo it. You may want to just get rid of it. So.